We have a special guest here today. I'm with Joe Principe, who is a business, finance, and corporate lawyer. He is fluent in Japanese. He's been involved in successful exits. He's worked with big, huge law firms. I know you're a partner now um, with a law firm that you're more closely and intimately uh, related with. And this is an individual who has the experience to talk about a whole number of topics with regards to M&A. I really am grateful to have you here. I wanted to talk to you about you know, term sheets, LOIs, purchase agreements, uh, subscription agreements for raising equity. We'll touch on debt financing through promissory notes. There's a whole bunch of stuff we want to touch on. It's going to be tough to go super deep on all of these, but hopefully we can shed some knowledge and some insight uh, as far as what these items are, red flags, all that good stuff. But firstly, Joe, thank you for coming on. And uh, I know we just real briefly touched on your background. Would you mind giving a little bit more of a proper introduction as to who you are and, and, uh, and what your background is? Yeah. Hey, you know, I appreciate um, having me on and I'm super happy to, you know, give people some advice, you know, tell people some uh, key issues to keep aware of a little bit about me. Um, so I start off my career in M&A and finance. I'm in business. Uh, I, I started off at the number one international uh, M&A and finance law firm, XUS Outbound Transactions. So they do. You know, like I was in Japan, we did stuff like Japanese people buying an Indian company. So that's what I mean when I say international. Uh, Americans don't do many international deals. That's one of the things about uh, corporate law. And so I started off there in M&A, working on billion dollar plus M&A transactions and financings. Um, I went on to work at a top U.S. company, uh, U.S. law firm, Baker McKenzie. Um, so they're like top five U.S. Uh, by revenue. Um, and then I, I also clerked at the SEC. I did a few other things um, uh, with big law firms, and uh, I worked in some tech businesses. So I, I worked in this uh, one business was the Elon Musk sort of Virgin Hyperloop One business that a lot of people have probably heard about. Uh, I was in-house counsel there, and I built a few of my own companies and sold those too. Um, and now I am uh, one of the things I'm doing with most of my time is I run a mid-market M&A boutique law firm. Um, called Optimist Legal, uh, and OptimistLegal.com uh, is our website. And uh, and what we do is we focus mostly on acquisition entrepreneurs, guiding them, uh, doing their legal work. So that that's uh, that's sort of my background. Perfect. And I mean, you're we're right at the right place here. Most of the folks watching here are interested in in M and A, doing acquisitions, and you know you're speaking with a lot of individuals who have a general business knowledge or who have a general interest in, in finance and acquisitions, but don't have obviously the experience that you have. So again, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. And I thought, you know, if we if we start from the top, mm -hmm. I mean, argue, we could argue, maybe you should start with discussing operating agreements, but I know most people here are most interested in in the deal making itself. So I thought, tell me if you agree, but yeah. I thought we'd start with, hey, you find this company, you're interested in this company and hey, you know, we reviewed the financials, we reviewed the financial documents, and we want to make an offer. And we figured out internally how much we want to offer. And so naturally, the first step, and I know you can probably provide some clarity of LOI versus a term sheet, but just speaking to that initial, um, perhaps we can start with that kind of conversation of how, do, how does one formally make, um, you know, a legally binding offer? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, and I can understand this is the critical stage of the transaction where a searcher, acquisition entrepreneur, he's basically ready to go. He's got his business mindset and his business plans going, but he's now he's encroaching on the legal space and he's got to be careful. Um, he's got to protect his interests. And so uh, in relation to that, I mean, one thing I'd add just as a get go is, you know, there's a lot of these terms, heads of terms. Memorandum of understanding, uh, indication of interest, expression of interest, uh, letter of intent. All these things are the same thing. Uh, it, depending on the type of transaction or the jurisdiction, they use different words. It, it, there, there, are these, uh, there are these agreements. They're typically non-binding except for as to a few of the um, clauses. And so, you know, if you if you want to make it binding, you can. That That's actually up to you because under contract law, it's... The freedom of the parties is the legal principle. Um, so, you know, you have freedom to uh, write what you want in the contract within the guise of the law. 
Um, so, you know, generally the rule of thumb is that the only terms that are binding in those agreements are the, uh, you know, if there's a breakup fee, which is not common, the confidentiality clause, which is important. You don't want the seller to be able to share your information uh, with his other uh, potential buyers and work around you. Right. Uh, and the exclusivity or the not no shot provision, which again, if you're if you're spending time and you're in you you want to do this transaction and you want the seller to work with you, you want to lock them up contractually, um, and that's what that exclusivity or no shot provision is all about. And uh, those are kind of the you could find a lot of examples of these provisions online, by the way. But the the main thing is here what I'm talking about is that you're locking up the seller. Um, to work just with you for usually a period of 60 to 90 days uh, for the transaction. And you don't want them shopping around your deal. Uh, it's, it's a waste of your time. That's kind of the key thing there. And it, frankly, if you're paying advisors at that time, it's, you're going to be losing money. So that's why that provision's is normal. Um, that's a little bit in relation to key terms of the LOI and the binding nature of the LOI. You know, those are usually the only binding terms. Everything else is usually non-binding. Why don't I throw it back to you to, to take us further? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, and that seems to be what we always talk about internally with, with my partner who, like you, has that, that legal background where it's, hey, it needs to be, uh, we need an exclusivity period you know, where we can't get shopped, essentially, or you have a period of time where we work in good faith to really move then you know, to a purchase agreement. And I know for some of these real small deals in our world, we do a lot of like right now, we do a lot of these sub $5 million SBA deals. And a lot of the audience will deal with that too. Where sometimes in that world, you don't even do the, the term sheet or the LOI. You go right to the purchase yeah. agreement. The big bad world of, of M&A, it seems like it's more term sheets and LOI. So maybe if you could yeah. talk, because I know a lot of the audience is interested in the, the bigger M&A world of, you know, these 10, 20, 30, 50, $100 million M&A deals. There, it seems like there's, from my understanding, you normally have a term sheet. Um, and then over time, well, sometimes it seems like simultaneous signing closes for the purchase. You sign the purchase agreement and then the deal closes. Whereas, you know, where we, in the smaller world, you do these staggered sign and closes on the purchase agreement. So I don't know if you can provide some real broad stroke clarity on how the big bad world of M&A works versus these kind of micro cap deals that, that we're talking about. Yeah, no, I definitely can. I have a few key points that I could say that can be very helpful for the audience. The first off is, is that the smaller the transaction you get, you see more skipping of the legalities. You see more, you know, skipping, you can call them formalities, but um, skipping of the formalities. But there's, there's always a, the, the key point here is there's always a reason for each of these stages and each of these clauses and each of these agreements. There's a reason people do in bigger deals and that reason does not disappear. Mm. It's because of the smaller deal. So if you're thinking, oh, this skip the LOI, and two months later, the seller, even though everything seemed good, they sell the transaction to somebody else um, after you haven't even finished DD yet, or maybe you've wasted time in DD, then don't be surprised because that's why you have an LO, uh, that's why you get an LOI with no shop costs. So there's a reason for all these things, and I recommend people, even on smaller transactions, just to just to walk the step. Uh, do the basic process, do the LOI, and then do the DD, and then sign the agreement after the DD is complete. Don't make any payments or uh, sign anything until after you've done that, unless the, unless the DD is a condition to closing of the agreement. But even then, in these smaller transactions, you should do the DD before you sign. DD for due right, date, just to be clear. Yeah. I, just to yeah. be clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, there, and that's because uh, these smaller transactions have a tendency to have more issues on due diligence than larger transactions because people are skipping formalities. Their accounting books aren't audited, if they're even put together correctly at all. Yeah. Um, and there's so many issues that do arise that, I, you know, I'm saying here and I say, just stick to that process. It's not that it's not a big burden anyways. You know, get your form LOI that you know and you know is right and use it. When you're buying various businesses, hmm. uh, and it's, you know, know the process and do your process. So uh, I don't think I don't think when you're dealing with these transactions, even if it's a couple million, that uh, taking risks uh, is the right way to go about things. I love that. You know, it's funny we uh, 
we've always been instructed by the listing brokers. Oh, skip the LOI step, go right to the the APA. They always want you to to go right to the purchase agreement. And we've not. We've 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 followed the path that that you're describing. And mm. and that's been I you know I hadn't thought comprehensively about the risks associated. But you're right. The one thing it does is it holds everyone's you know kind of quote unquote feet to the fire for a period of time, so you can work in good faith to see if this deal can truly get done. Whereas going right to the purchase agreement, you put all this emphasis, all of this legal work into something that you may look under the hood then and quickly realize, at least from the buyer's perspective, from my perspective, you then get under the hood and you realize, I don't even, I don't even want to do this. And we spent all this time negotiating this, this purchase agreement that, you know, there was no point. So, I mean, it makes sense to me. Yeah. But that's great insight from your perspective with the experience. By the way. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And by the way, there's, there's two points that I can touch on there real quick related to what you were just saying. So first of all, it's no surprise that the broker and the seller want you to sign right away. Right. That's in their, that, that's in their interest. The broker and these guys are great guys. Uh, this isn't a morality issue. It is, it is merely their business to get you to sign that agreement. Totally. Uh, so, but it is not necessarily your interest to immediately sign that agreement if you're a buyer. Yep. So that, that's one point. And the second point is, you know, it's really not uncommon to get in and look at these businesses and see, oh my gosh, they don't have any contracts for their revenue sources or their supplier contracts or third rate. And a lot of people accept those risks, uh, but that's not necessarily always the best decision. Uh, there's, that's a lot of risk right there. Uh, and then you're going to have to do more DD like customer interviews, which people do skip also. So there, there are there's, there are significant risks there that, that that arise that people should be aware of. I love that, and I concur with you that generally, from my experience, the smaller the transaction, the greater um, uncertainty you have, and the the more volatility you have once you look under the hood as far as what you're going to find. Um, that's been my experience. There's some pretty interesting things. Uh, emphasis on interesting, interesting things you can. <laughs> When you get to the <laughs> right. on some of these deals. So I, I totally agree. But moving forward for the sake of time, let's say you submit an LOI. It gets accepted. Both parties sign it. You, uh, you go through some, you go into diligence. You start really getting under the hood for the, the sake of moving this. Well, maybe you want to comment on, do you want to, con do you have comments you'd like to provide on this intermediary stage before, because ultimately I want to take it to the point where, Hey, you sign a purchase agreement now, you know, I want to, I'd, I'd love to get your take on the purchase agreement, but do you want to talk about that inter intermediary phase between an LOI and in a purchase agreement being signed by both parties? Sure. You know, just to keep it short, I'll just mention one or two key things that come to mind during that phase. Firstly, as I mentioned before, the, well, the, the traditional path is this, you know, you start DD and you start the, the contract negotiations or you start preparing a contract. So traditional methodology is that you, you get to, you get on those simultaneously. However, it's not uncommon that DD doesn't start until after the agreement is executed and uh, satisfactory DD is a condition to closing under the agreement. Right. That's not uncommon also. So, but uh, the key point there really, the, or a second, a key point there I really want to touch on is, um, uh, a lot of sellers, they want, they want to rush people through DD and they want to say they gave you everything they asked for that you asked for. And you, you kind of have to have, maybe you could get some DD lists online and, or from your lawyer, preferably, <laughs> uh, uh, get and really know what you're looking for. Cause it's not uncommon for them to provide things that just are wrong. We have one transaction right now where the seller said there's only X shares um, but they also said that there were many shares, uh, in a different, at a different point in time and through a different document. And so, well, how do you know how many shares you're even going to buy in a share acquisition, uh, situation? You know, if you just listen to the seller, then you're going to be off to a really bad start. So I guess my, uh, my summary of my point is that just be extra aware of during that, uh, intermediary phase or doing this, uh, DD stuff that you're actually getting what you're looking for. And don't, don't feel bad to go back again and say, no, 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 but this, no, 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 but this is what I'm looking for. It's, it's you shouldn't feel uh, odd about that. That's very normal. Um, to ask for the same thing four times is not abnormal. If they're not providing it, you need to get it. 
So just be aware of what you need to get and make sure you're getting it and don't don't accept anything less, especially with corporate documents. If you're in a share acquisition situation like that is the thing you're buying the company, it better be all put together accurately. You don't want somebody else to have owned some shares and you didn't buy those shares, but you thought you were buying the whole business. So that's a that's a no bueno situation. Certainly a, a no bueno situation. It's funny you say that. We have a deal uh, under contract right now um, and we're going through diligence. We started diligence before we got it under contract and then continued diligence as a, what, a condition of closing that we're satisfied. But to that point, we've had to ask for, for documents. And I don't think it's anything malicious on the sell side. You're dealing with a big, long diligence list. There's a whole bunch of items. Often with these smaller mom and pop sellers, they've never gone through this process before. It, it can be overwhelming for them. At least that's been my experience. And, okay. you know, we've had to ask several times for things. And I think it's just one of those where things fall through the cracks. But it's funny. I mean, I'm going through this right now. So yeah. your comments, I can specifically vouch for and say it's true. And if you don't ask for it, then, you know, you've essentially, uh, what, a sin of, of omission? You're, you're missing a key, a key item to to go through diligence with. So yeah, you, you're taking on, you're taking on the, the risk of that issue, depending on how you, your agreements are structured, but yeah, no, exactly. And I agree with you. I, I don't, I never assume there's ill intent. Nonetheless, sometimes there, there is. So, yeah, there can know. be. Though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there can be. And the bigger the deal, the, 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 the higher things at stakes in it, it happens a lot. Um, the bigger the deal. Yeah. It actually isn't infrequent. It's not infrequent. So, and and even for these smaller deals, I mean, a lot of the folks here watching or, or listening, you know, they're getting started. I mean, I when I got started, I was broke, and even like a you, you hear multi, you know, one to five million dollar deal is considered in the world of M and A a very small transaction, and yet those amounts of uh, that that sum for a an individual or a real small kind of startup group. I mean, this is. This is meaningful stuff. This is uh, this is really meaningful. Yeah, yeah. So it's still really it matters no matter the size of the transaction, and then you know, yeah, it's real. The risk is real. So I digress. We could talk more about all these topics, but to keep the the ball short, <laughs> yeah. here, full of your time, let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about purchase agreements. Let's say you know, LOI was signed. Great. We went through some introductory diligence. So far, so good. Now, perhaps, you know, at least to use kind of these smaller deal uh, paths, now everyone is, is prepared to, uh, to sign a purchase agreement. Would you mind talking about just the big picture of it? Maybe talk about stock versus asset purchase agreements. I get that question a lot. Um, yeah. What would you provide as far as kind of big picture clarity on, on structuring a, a purchase agreement? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we could start off by letting everybody know that the, the, the most – the most uh, common way that you're going to be going about things in these smaller transactions is not going to be these merger type things. It's going to be an asset purchase, a stock purchase, or a membership interest purchase. So the membership interest is if it's an LLC and the stock purchase if it's a corporation. Um, and so those are the, the, three, uh, the three big transactions. Um, you know, why do people pick one or the other? Well, between the equity acquisition, so between the membership interest or the stock versus asset, uh, you know, there's, it's easy to find this type of stuff online. There's a few basic considerations. You know, so, uh, I'm not going to talk about the seller's considerations, but sellers have an interest, either or, depending on their situation, because uh, how the taxation occurs in relation to the assets or the sale is different based if it's a equity, so stock or membership interest. Or if it's an asset from the buyer side, these are kind of the key points that you're going to be thinking about. You don't know, uh, you don't know, what you don't know about some of these small businesses. They may have some liabilities that they haven't disclosed and you don't necessarily want to be suing them for failure to disclose or for breach of the agreement. Uh, these, these liabilities I'm talking about, like, Maybe somebody, maybe they had a product liability situation. There's, there's all different ways one could have a liability. And maybe they had an outstanding loan uh, that wasn't secured by the assets in this hypothetical. And so people often pick an asset purchase because 
you're not taking all the liabilities of the entity with you. If you buy the entity, you get all the liabilities with it, unless you carve them out, um, which, which, you know, you don't, that's just a whole nother stuff. So uh, asset purchase, you just get to pick what you want. Say you just, okay, these are the, this is the part of the business that I know is important. I'm just going to buy this part. Um, that gives me a little bit of uh, security of my peace of mind, I wanted to say. Um, that, okay, I know that there's not something hidden. You know, a lot of, maybe a lot of the documents weren't really well put together. These mom and pop deals, you know, they don't do all the corporate formalities. Uh, I'm just going to buy these assets. Transferring titles a very straightforward and publicly recorded thing. So you know you're going to get these assets. You're secure. That's, that's one aspect, the liability. Um, another key aspect, I guess, what's, what's big one number two? I don't know. For, for me, this isn't, this isn't necessarily what people say is big number two. For me, it's the simplicity of the transaction. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Maybe people don't see this unless they do a couple of them or several of them. But when you just do a stock purchase, it's super straightforward. Um, the DD is, uh, it, it, so it's more straightforward with an asset purchase. Um, now you have all these title, tra you, you have to transfer the assets, you have to get new, you have to get the, the workers comp uh, situated, you have to um, retitle the assets, um, you have to get uh, the business insurance situated, you have to get the holding company situated, um, that's going to be acquiring the assets unless you already have one. Um, you have to get any business licenses set up. Um, any uh, reseller certificates. There's so many things yes. that people kind of take for granted. And they say, oh, an asset purchase is, is the way people say to go. I want to do that. But if you just buy the stock or the membership, the membership interest, all that stuff's already done for you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't that. have to do anything. Yep. So, so that's my point number two for you. I love, by the way, I have to interject. I'm so glad you brought that up because I didn't have any understanding of that until I'd thrown myself into doing an asset. <laughs> and then you're like, oh my yeah. God, there's about a hundred things to hook up. You're giving your EIN to a hundred different people. You're every single oh, vendor, God. every single everything. That is the big downfall operationally. Those two to three months right around the period of an asset. <laughs> and then we did two at one point, oh. same day. And then you really, you know, I'm surprised I even still have hair after that. It was, it was a lot. So, oh gosh. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That's a, thank you. Because it's relevant and it, it does take up time and energy. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's it. And I'm happy that you can vibe with me on that because yeah. so often it's, you know, there are reasons to do either, but Hey, like smoothness of the transition period, we call it post-merger integration, the PMI. The smoothness of that is very important. Like you shouldn't be creating more work for yourself. Indeed, you just kind of want to let the business keep moving. Like that that should be your objective. The business is going. I'm going to let all of these wins that are happening keep going because that's where I'm, I'm getting my profit at the end of the year. Um, I want that. You don't want to be getting your hands in and turning everything over. And that's not the point. I mean... Sure, you can do growth, but growth isn't supposed to be, you're not supposed to, I don't know. You know what I'm getting at. So. I, I, yes. Now, again, though, you don't have the liabilities. That's nice, yeah. right? That's yeah. Deal. So, but yeah, you do all that. You have a ton of post-close integration headache. Um, and, then, and then there's the, but there is the taxable. Uh, and I know this is really more of a accounting question, but the my understanding mm -hmm. is there are, legitimate tax benefits for doing an asset deal relative to a stock or a membership interest transaction. Is that your understanding? Yeah, no, there are, there are. Um, and, and that kind of goes back to the person's tax situation or the business's tax situation. One thing to keep in mind is that when you buy it, this is kind of the con of the other side of what you're saying. There's benefits on the asset side. People always talk about that. But if you think about the benefits on the stock side for a from a tax perspective, uh, you don't get to acquire any of the, uh, so, okay, so say the business has a lot of uh, tax credits, but they have a lot of good things going on in their tax that could be used to, like NOLs, that right. can be, uh, so in, yeah, in future years, 
they have some tax that they can use to offset any uh, other costs or stuff later on. I'm not trying to get into tax. In um, NOI, I'm, uh, so I'm not now. a tax. Okay. And I'm not a tax lawyer. Right. Um, so I'm, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm just speaking to the very basic points here. Sure. Um, so when that happens, when you buy assets, you don't get any of that stuff. Right. Uh, so, you, you know, the next year rolls around. Maybe they had a lot of good tax credits or uh, a good tax situation going on. There's a lot of things that could be. So I'm being very general that you could have applied to the following operating years. Yep. And uh, you don't get to do that in asset purchase. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, and you said NOL. I didn't mean to interject there, but I 99% sure that's a net operating loss. So you're carrying your taxable losses forward. And then you had also recently, we took advantage of this, and it's something that you can look for. Uh, there was the ERC, um, the Employment uh, Retention Credit, that, uh -huh. that uh -huh. I've heard of folks uh, applying those to, to stock deals that they do. And hey, prior owner didn't take advantage of that ERC and then you file the ERC and you know there's I don't know I, I have not had that happen for an acquisition I've done but I've heard others so yeah that's a that's a hell of a point I I didn't think of that but you're right that's a great point um yeah yeah it's you know people usually should it's, it's it is recommended that people get their uh tax advisor or if it's a tax accountant or whatever whatever they're doing on the advisory side that they talk to them about the transaction. That's kind of another one of those things that in the small ordeals, people kind of want to skip over. Mm. Um, and they're, you know, they're getting a lawyer is already something they may not be familiar with, uh, an acquisition lawyer. It's kind of like you're buying a house without your real estate broker. It's not something I'd recommend. Um, it, you know, and <laughs> it's quite a big deal. Right. Uh, you should definitely have a broker. I have a lot of people don't. My dad's a broker, so I'm very familiar with the circumstances. <laughs> Some people do it without one, but in a for sale by owner type situation. Uh, but what I'm getting at there, I suppose, is that, you know, you should, you really should uh, take into consideration the value that your advisors are adding. And on the tax side, there's definitely a lot of input you should be getting from your tax advisor. No doubt. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about uh, the purchase agreement here. I know for those listening or watching, I've spoken in a separate video about some of the business uh, items that we look for. I've made a couple of big mistakes. Uh, love to see the pup there, by the way. I've made a couple. <laughs> yeah. of, just a huge, monstrous head just uh, shows up. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Airplay. Um, but no, there's there's a video I made that talked about some of the items that I think are really important. Some of these small deals, they don't um, include what real M&A lawyers would call working capital. Uh, a la the uh -huh. H payables and the H payables, like the, the basically the cash flow of the business. A lot of these smaller deals, they try to sell you the business cash free, yeah. debt free, and without AR or an AP. And if you're dealing with a business that has a meaningful cash flow cycle, that that can become a really significant item. I know that because I made that mistake firsthand. Oh, um, you did? Yeah. I, I did. Could you, could you, do you have a moment? Could, would you be able yeah. to tell a little detail? Yeah. That? So the punchline, I thought I did my calculus correct as far as the cash flow of the business. And I thought basically that not including the AR in the business was justified because of the, the basis that the business was bought at, which actually, I don't think it was a matter of the business being misvalued. I believe because, and I, you know, I own the business to this day. It, it's been a good business, mm -hmm. but this was a business um, doing some specialty contracting work that had realistically about 60 day full cash flow cycles and was dealing with you know hundreds of thousands oh, of dollars, uh, worth of ar and i thought i had the 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 correct amount of of, of working capital uh it, i should really say an operating cash to a, to get through that initial cash, yeah. until i built my my ar and built a cash flow position um, I do this because you're like in a cash flow cycle where you're paying out, but money's coming in and you're, you're in flow, uh, you know, but yeah, yeah. This is without the AR and the AP, you weren't. So punchline is, is I barely had enough operating capital. I thought because the lender blessed oh, it, geez. I thought that because the lender blessed it, you know, obviously they wanted to actually send me into the deal with significantly less cash. <laughs> and I, and I told them, I said, I think 
you know, I said, this is, I appreciate the commitment letter, which is the, the letter that the lender will give you when they're ready to basically commitment to lend. You know, I'll never forget the day. I said, I really look forward to doing this deal with you. I appreciate the commitment letter, but you're, you're trying to take an extra 60,000 of, of my cash and pledge it to the down payment. I'm not comfortable with it going to a down payment. I want to have that liquid because this business has serious cash needs and I have to build a position. And they came back the following Monday and agreed. And we signed that updated commitment letter. But both of our calculus was totally wrong. They were even more wrong than I was. And had we had I not vowed for that extra 60 or so thousand, I mean, for a business of this size, you don't want to get down to five figures in operating cash. And we certainly got to that point. And I didn't have any legitimate net worth at the time to pull from or cash to pull from. So it was dodgy, you know, it was a short of it and uh, far from recommended and nerve wracking. But we, uh, <laughs> we got through it, you know, we got through it, but it, it taught me, um, it taught me a lot. So there's some certain things you really want to be thoughtful of licensing agreements. If you do an asset deals, another one I know from firsthand experience, you make sure you're licensing, you have like a, a path to ensure that you're able to operate legally in the state and jurisdiction that you're in. So there's some other stuff. Or yeah, or you'll, and then suddenly, how are you <laughs> generating that capital to keep paying your bills? Yeah. Um, that by the way, that's a heinous story. Uh, I can I can imagine it must have that's the feel it must have felt like you're in that risky business situation oh, with yeah. the timing, and if the customers are being late in their payments or something or however the business is, uh, the, I think the general takeaway there is don't make you know don't make too many assumptions. Um, yeah. That's why there's generally a generous working capital period. Um, and be very careful. Like, uh, when you're in situations that can result in big problems like that, just, just, just be, ex be extra careful. Give yourself a huge buffer. Or, I mean, if you're getting a loan, for example, they might not approve a huge buffer, but the, whatever it is, like give yourself the space and, uh, that space will, if you didn't need it, that just means you're in even better financial position, yep. um, as opposed to you know, being in a, in a really bad one. So. Yeah. Amen. I couldn't agree more. And I thought I was putting myself by saying no to the lender and asking for the extra 50 or 60. I figured now I'm really cush, you know, now I'm really in the, in the, in the, <laughs> it couldn't have been further from the truth, but another one I think that's worth mentioning, especially for these smaller transactions is don't take the uh, professional opinion of a lender or even an advisor uh, totally um, to the bank. Cause my story quite literally signifies that, you know, you have a pr professional lending institution providing on, you know, lending letterhead that everything is blessed and, and such. And it wasn't, it just, had we gone with the way they wrote it up, it would have been even worse. So you, you, you cross your T's dot your I's. And as they say in the trades where I'm in measure twice, uh, cut once, you know, yeah. Hey, you know, I agree completely with that. And there's something I'd add there. First of all, it is quite surprising that that happened to you, you know, like, yeah, you definitely could have made the assumption, uh, you know, these guys are literally a bank, right? You know, they're the ones that should know this. Uh, it's a good thing for uh, acquisition entrepreneurs to keep in mind that if you're dealing with smaller banks, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the, the people are a little bit different than depending on the size of the bank to kind of put it, uh, Frank. And, yeah. uh, the same thing goes with legal advisors. And so you gotta be really careful if you're dealing with a small town lawyer and no offense, like good people, nothing wrong with them, but they might not have had that big firm, New York, uh, killers in New York type, uh, M&A experience. Uh, and that's the experience that's going to have that, that's going to, the experience that's going to, your lender, if you had like a, a city or something, they would not make that mistake, you know, right. uh, right. or, uh, you know, whatever, whoever it is. And same from the legal side, you know, be really careful. Like you're, if you're depending on your lawyer for something and, you know, maybe he hasn't worked at a big firm doing him an A, like, you know, that, that's a huge uh, like that's something to really be aware of. If you worked at some mid-sized firm and did M&A for 10, 15 years, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, that's nothing, nothing to balk at. Um, but uh, in the legal profession, it, it, 
the, the, you know, for non-lawyers out there, it's probably most people, something to be very wary of. The, the caliber is night and day. Uh, it's, it's kind of scary, actually. It's like going to Johns Hopkins doctor hmm. or going to a small town G, general practitioner GP. He might be a great guy, but he's not a Johns Hopkins doctor. Uh, and he's not going to, he, he's, you know, he's not going to have the same solutions. He's not going to see the same problems. Uh, so that's something people need to be ultra aware of. I see it all the time that people just don't know that. So something to call out. I love that. My uh, business partner who has extensive experience at those top, um, top legal firms. And that was something I looked for. I did have the insight to get that one right, but I will say on the other side, and I, say this if uh, my partner's watching and I say this with love because uh, he and I are real close, but he took that working on 50 million to $5 billion uh, deal sizes uh, mindset and intensity to the smaller uh, <laughs> and just blew people up because it's just, it's cut. You know, he's, he has the 917, isn't that the New York, the 917 area code on his phone, like uh, proper, yeah. Proper New York lawyer. <laughs> He's a New Yorker. He's a yeah, New Yorker. Proper, and has just terrified some of these these smaller uh, brokers and lenders. And, and he's. I had to tell him, hey, I love it, but let's make sure we don't <laughs> uh, rip the relationship raw because uh -huh. a couple of stories that I'll, I'll hold close to vest. But there's been some, there, there's been a learn. It, you know what it is, is... Um, you know, it's such a different world. This is why I keep trying to make this conversation with regards to the smaller M&A deals and then these, you know, $100 million M&A transactions. There's just so many differences I've learned in working with my partner and similar to what you're talking about, Joe. It's just, there's a lot of nuance. So, you know, that's what we're hopefully trying to shine a little bit of light onto. But I, I agree. I mean, he's, he's a true world-class professional and has worked at these legitimate places like yourself. And that was one of the reasons when I saw your resume, I said, this is fantastic because you you can tell there's no there's no hiding when you're dealing with uh, these huge private equity, yeah. or huge clients and stuff like that. Yeah, they're they're vicious. Uh, they're out to maximize their gain, uh, and they'll uh, they'll be uh, they'll apply their intelligence in every way possible. Uh, and, you know, if they're working, uh, you know, twelve plus hour days. Uh, around some of the best professionals in the world in that field, it's no surprise that they're just going to be really good at it. Yeah. And so it, it's, I'm happy you, you get what I'm talking about, about that New Yorker experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just, I mean, I laugh about it. I, I live on the West coast uh, currently. And uh, it's, it's, it's funny to me uh, because the cult, I'll call it a, cult, a huge cultural difference. I'll call it that. Yeah, certainly. Good stuff. Really good stuff. I think this will be extremely valuable uh, for the audience. And I appreciate, again, Joe, you, you being here. A couple of things I wanted to touch on before we let you go. I don't want to hold you too long. I know sure. you're going to die Friday. But if we can touch briefly. Okay, so let's, let's start from the top. We found a company we like. We put in an offer through an LOI. It got accepted. We've done diligence. We've looked for these red flags. We, we've said, okay, we're good with it. We've made a determination that we want to move forward with, and it's probably as stated in the LOI, whether it's going to be an asset. I'm pretty sure in our deals, we generally specify in the LOI if it's going to be an asset versus you know a stock or actually a membership interest deal if it's an LLC, but I digress. But anyways, we then work on the purchase agreement, negotiate that back and forth. My experience is that goes back and forth a couple of times between buyer and seller. They pass it back and forth, negotiate these items, yada, yada, get it signed. Now... Uh, we're to the point where we got to go raise capital, you know, ostensibly mm -hmm. let's assume for a minute that we're, we're not going to self fund. Most people on this want to raise capital from debt and equity sources. Would you briefly talk about, you know, the legal instruments uh, associated with raising debt and equity and some real, you know, broad stroke thoughts that you would uh, implore people to think about when raising capital? Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, happy to do that. I guess a, a first point of note is that a, a lot of the, the people that may listen to this are probably going to be doing SBA lending. Is that correct? There's a good, there's a good, uh, there's a good chunk that certainly will. Yep. Okay. So one thing I'd like to note there, uh, well, obviously, you know, the SBA lender is going to be providing their form lending agreement. Yep. So, I mean, there, there's that, I mean, not to get into that, but to get into something 
closely related, which is that uh, the SBA terms are very strict. If you want to satisfy for an SBA loan, the way your transaction is structured has to fit it. Uh, yep. Their rules and the rules are they're very strict. So you should become familiar with their rules. If it takes even a couple days of reading the SBA rules online or more than a couple days, you should do it. You should set that time aside. You should get really familiar with it. You should become conversant in it um, because when it comes to your options for how you can structure the transaction, it's severely delimiting. Uh, like one of the, like, for example, to give one example is um, you're limited. So you have to buy hundred percent of the business. Um, you're limited in the way you can structure an earn out from the seller. If you, if you want the seller to retain a portion of ownership interest, if it's a stock purchase, can't do that. Right. Um, you can't. You can, however, pay them out on a consultancy basis. So you'd offer them to pay them in that way, uh, or through the seller note. So that's something to keep in mind. Like if you're doing SBA, just become familiar with the rules. Um, I'm more familiar with big uh, with big transactions than with SBA transactions. Um, but you know, it's they're, they're it's pretty they're pretty straightforward, honestly. So a second thing to get into. There, I guess, is the seller financing, uh, very commonly used in a lot of these smaller transactions. And what's that? what that's done through <clears throat> is through a, a promissory note is the name of the instrument. And I, uh, I will go ahead and talk a little bit about this, the instrument, because it's something that uh, you should be drafting if you're a buyer. And uh, it's not something necessarily that an SBA lender is going to provide you with their form agreement. In relation to so so with this promissory note what uh what's important about this promissory note um but first i'll throw it back to you is there anything you'd like me to i mean i'm going to speak to a few of you know the, the the key things that people should be aware of that is market standard uh I'll, I'll ask you real quick uh is there anything you'd specifically like me to touch on or uh or you know is, is that okay uh does that sound good about something to talk about Firstly, I think you're spot on as far as the kind of where the conversation's going and I'll pass the baton back to you. But one thing I'll say just before I do is amen with regards to your comment on the SBA being very strict in what they do allow. I'll give you one more example for the audience here and then Joe pass yeah. back on the promissory notes because I've done a few of these SBA negotiations and whatnot. We're working on a few right now. And one example, another one, so we talked earlier about how it's so nice to integrate through a stock uh, or a membership interest uh, agreement because of the, the ease of the transaction. Well, here's a little weird fluff for you. And I, didn't, I learned this the hard way. If you do a stock deal, then the SBA requires every single equity holder in the acquiring entity to personally guarantee joint and severally, which I believe means... <laughs> entirely like every even a one percent holder has to be entirely potentially responsible yeah. for, for this and so they basically make it all but impossible there's some workarounds and quotes and that's for another time another place but it almost makes it impossible for you to do a stock deal if you're doing an sba transaction um without some serious creativity there's ways to get around it but it, but, it, but it, it's a, it's a very much restrictive item i geek out a bunch about sba deals because they're easy lob tosses in my opinion as far as government-backed financing to get your first deal done. The, the lenders are a lot less strict. They're also sometimes a little confused, all of the working capital problem I had prior. So there's pros and cons. But with that, you know, seller finance transactions or, you know, commercial financings, I think are quite possible for your first couple of M&A deals, which most of the audience is. And so I think you're right on the spot as far as talking about seller finance for mystery notes. Uh, if you pick up on it, but okay. I just want to double back and say, you're right. And there's a lot of this stuff you have to think about going in, but anyway, yeah. uh, one of the mystery notes. Oh, okay, cool. No, I think your anecdotes are really great. Uh, one thing I need to do better is try and give some examples. That's what my partner, Omid, uh, always tells me to do, but I'm still a student in many ways. <laughs> uh, you provide the technical and I'll provide the, uh, these are the goofy things I've done stories and we'll be a, a Gosh, of I, okay. I love you have, I love you, you know, run straight through and had those practical experiences and seen it firsthand and you learn from it though. So sure. It might, okay. it might've been like, ah, but Hey, you learn from it. And that's what, you know, makes you as an expert and being able to kind of tell other people a little bit here or there. And 
and say, hey, here's the guideposts, etc. Right. No, no doubt. Certainly. Uh, okay. And so, you know, to, to get into the promissory notes a little bit, I'll talk about a few. I'll talk about some of the general points, uh, not to not to go not to be a lawyer. I could talk about them for hours. <laughs> I... uh, but I'll talk about some of the general points and then some of the, the things that happen. Um, so, hey, I mean, you know, there's the tenor. So how many years? Well, OK, firstly, like when are you going to start payment under it? You know, if you're also doing an SBA loan. The SBA lender may require that you don't start paying under anything else, including under the seller note for a couple of years. Depends how many years in the transaction on the lender, really. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Like, when can you start payment? Will you tell the seller, hey, I can't start paying you until two years later because my lender said so. That's something. That's right. one of the important terms of payment. Uh, another thing is the tenor. So how many years uh, during which will you be making repayment of the sum of the note? You know, that it, that's variable. It depends on the transaction. I, I recommend people to try and maximize the duration of that. Don't get hopeful and say, oh, I'll repay you in two years. Hey, if the transaction really allows for that and maybe the seller note was really tiny and eh, it's not a big deal, then that makes sense. But on the other hand, you know, it, it's in your best interest as a buyer to have as long as possible uh, over as long term of, uh, as possible to make repayment of that sum. And negotiate for as long as you can. Don't be unreasonable. Uh, but, you know, up to several years is totally uh, accepted in many transactions. Um, so don't think you need to be doing two years or something necessarily uh, for the, uh, the tenor. Um, and uh, in, but in other words, payment period is what I'm referring in to. In other words, like the term. term. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The term is yeah. another yeah. word. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm talking about there. The interest is obviously another key term, the interest rate. Uh, you know, there's a few, there's a market standard typically like four to 6%. Um, you know, it, again, it's in your interest to get the smallest interest rate pro possible. Start off at three, start off at 2.5. Um, you know, you, you're supposed to be, you're as the business guy uh, running your own transaction, you know, you talk to the seller and really get a feel for them and really talk to them and try and get the best term you can there. Get the lowest interest rate you can. They say it has to be six. Talk to them. And they'll be like, oh, you know, I'd really like it. Talk to them again. Oh, I'd really like it. You know, uh, you know, uh, be your little um, own own warrior um, on all the terms. Not, not, not in an unreasonable or uh, an aggressive way necessarily. Um, and so, you know, try to get the best terms you can. Uh, moving on. You know, the seller note, uh, the uh, promissory note for the seller is going to have, uh, it's going to take security over the assets in an asset transaction or the shares of the business um, in a share or a you know, membership interest transaction. When I say shares, I am referring to stock. Uh, those two terms are used interchangeably. Um, and so that's what I'm referring to. They'll take a security interest. Um, uh, they'll have a lien. If it's an asset purchase, they'll take a lien against, for example, the title, a lien against the assets. That's something to keep in mind. That's standard. Um, I'd recommend if you're a buyer, start off without that term in there. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it is market standard. But um, again, you know, your objective is to get the best terms you can. Um, it, what you can do instead of having that in there is start off with just uh, that you're going to be paying pen penalty. Um, this is another term. Hey, during the any, if you don't make payment on time, you have to pay a penalty interest rate. Um, so that, that's another term that's pretty common. But, you know, have that as your main go to if things don't go forward, that um, people have to pay the that you have to pay penalty interest, not necessarily that they can repossess, take back uh, the assets um, on default. So that's another key term. I guess one of the final key terms I'll touch on is uh, the terms of default. Um, so when you, what does it mean for you not to make payment under the agreement? Um, or wh what does, yeah, what does it mean for, uh, um, so if you, if you miss your payment date, what happens or, uh, or how do we define that? And so to give you some examples of events of default is, uh, one is you miss your payment date. Another one is the company's going bankrupt. So 
That's a, that's a common term of default. Another one is if you're restructuring the business. That's another common term of default. And a, and a few other ones. So what's the takeaway here about, uh, and I call them events of default. That's not what everybody calls them. That's sort of the legal proper way to say it. What are defined as the events of default under the seller note? And uh, it's something to, 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 to take away here is have them uh, as limited as possible because you're the buyer. You want there to be as few ways you can default under this note as possible. And again, I'm not saying to be unreasonable and I'm not saying to, I mean, it's, it's your option. It's again, the principle of contract law, freedom to contract. Um, you get what you can. Uh, I, I'm not advising people to shark sellers. I'm not advising that. I think people should always be in very good faith. Um, but, you know, put some events uh, of default in there that are very sensible to you uh, and not necessarily extremely broad. Now the seller's counsel will come back and they'll be revising these things. That's the onus is on them to do that. And if they come back and make it a little broader, that's completely okay. But at least you would have done your best uh, and tried to get the best terms or the most reasonable terms for your situation that you could. Um, and so why is that important? Well, if you default and you lose everything, that's a really big deal for you. You don't want that to happen. So you want to really make sure it doesn't happen. Um, I like to put default periods, like non-payment periods. Uh, so like if this thing's happening, you have 30 to 60 days to fix it. I like to have those periods pretty long, 60 days, 90 days if you can get it. Um, yeah, you could say the market standards like between 20 and 40. It really depends. Uh, it's, it's around 30 is not unreasonable. Around 30 days, you know, 30 days to make payment for a missed payment. That sounds that sounds pretty standard and pretty reasonable. Asking for 60 days gives you more cushion. Um, so keep that type of thing in mind. Uh, if things go wrong, do you want to be on the line for 30 days? You know, again, we were talking earlier about these situations where you're like, oh, crap, uh, when, when you're on the nerves. Right. Uh, and this is one of those situations where you can give yourself a buffer and because your goal is to repay that seller note. So you're, you're aligned, you know, you want to pay that note, but sometimes if you need 60 days because something happened in the business, um, you, you'll thank yourself later. You'll thank yourself that you gave yourself that buffer. Um, I know I got a little technical there. I was trying to speak in common parlance about some of these legal issues. Um, but I think that my point was, was clear and now I'll throw it back to you. Uh, what do you have to say about that? No, that's, I was taking notes here. That's really good, good stuff. I mean, you're talking about giving as much flexibility as possible in these promissory notes. It's, it's a promise to repay, but within that, what is the promise? And you get to define that. Well, and if you take the draft, if you draft it, I thought you brought yeah. it up too, that if you draft it as the, the debtor, you lawyers always fight for my understanding for first, first pass. Who's going to take the first pass? at the document, right? You get to craft. Yes, yes they do. <laughs> you get to craft the foundation of what we're dealing with here. So I think that was a subtle, but really important point as well. It's always preferable if your party and your side gets the draft first, but no, I think that's super applicable. I love your, your call to action to start at a two and a half to a 3% rate. I mean, to be frank, that's something I can do and we could do better. We tend to go a little higher and I thinking back and thinking why, like, and you know, I real quickly, just to very quickly kind of, share a mini story here. We made an offer just I think maybe a week ago, which actually was, was accepted. It was a LOI that was accepted. And I mean, it was a fair offer. It really was, but you know, the market has shifted a bit. There's a bit more fear in the market relative, certainly uh, to like a year ago, um, liquidity is tightened up, you know, quantitative easing is, is no longer, you know, mm. things have changed. And so we, in our offer made our offer reflect some of these uh, ch changing times and, and the terms were a bit more favorable to us as a buyer. And you know what? It was accepted exactly as uh, our offer was accepted exactly as drafted. There were no uh, changes. There wasn't a counter. And sometimes there are counters and sometimes they're not. But if you, you're negotiating, you're negotiating against yourself if you don't give yourself the best, the best play. And that's, and I've committed that sin uh, personally. Yeah. Everybody does. The first yeah, and why times. do this? Why do it? It's a great point. I love. No, that. I think and just to, just to add in a little bit there, I think that's a really powerful story. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm not going to get that, so I'm not going to ask for it. That's a very backwards way of thinking. 
right? Uh, you're not like don't 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 be like don't be a dick about it. Just be very respectful and reasonable. And and like you said with that story, and it's, it's something for people to reflect upon, is that uh, when the markets change, so do terms of the, the standard deal terms or what what buyers and sellers can get. And that's a powerful uh, lever to raise in negotiations is to say, OK, this is the market conditions or, OK, these are the business's conditions. Um, those are all the things you should be thinking about as your arguments for your negotiable points. Yep. And uh, in that story in specific, you know, it sounds like you did exactly what you should have done is, you know, ask for terms that were good, um, that are there, you know, you're going to be able to satisfy them. Again, like just kind of keeping things really fundamental, not get too fluffy about it. Like you can do this. This is good. The market reflects this. Why not? That's a good mentality. Um, a lot of people, uh, especially in the smaller deals, there's actually a lot less back and forth. And the big deals, like you'll get three back and forth on something like that. And then you'll have to push your point. You'll have to really express yourself. You'll have to say, hey, OK, I know you guys are asking for more, but this is why I, I did that because of the market. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? You know, however that conversation goes out. So that's something that people should, um, even if they're not, you know, first time buyers or something of a business, they should really kind of, uh, you know, if it takes a little building up of confidence to speak or if it, it takes just kind of clearing their mind to speak, they should really just be willing to uh, I'm call. Um, they should really be willing to express themselves. Amen. I love that. And. You know, just real quickly, I'll say we've seen, I've, I've commented on this a number of times, but even in the last 120 days, we've seen a change in uh, a lot of deals have come back to contract, they fell out of contract, the buyer couldn't perform, rising interest rates. Uh, it, it's feeling more and more like a buyer's market relative to the past. Mm. Now, I, I don't have as much of a comment on larger deals, the $50 million deal. That is... That is happening. That is already happening in the bigger deal market. There's already a drying up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Times are changing. So ask for what you want. Um, amen. Good stuff. No, I mean, I think that covers uh, the permissory note. I would just say I've seen uh, debt financing documents that are four pages long. They're two pages long. I've seen them be 20 pages long. Um, if it's an SBA deal, the lender is drafting that there's, there's not, from my understanding, there's really not any negotiation about like an SBA finance, <laughs> not, you don't get the they're, first, they're usually, reason, they're, they're usually reasonable. What's that? Oh, oh sorry. I, I was just saying, and they're usually reasonable. They drafted. It's usually pretty reasonable. Um, yeah. Yeah. That 1% holder has to guarantee the whole loan. Super reasonable. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> sign. I insist. Yeah. Not a problem. There's that part. Yeah, the, the, the P the personal guarantees the PGs. The I mean the rule for the audience is never sign a PG. This is something you learn in law school. Never sign one ever. If an SBA loan though, I mean you have to. So you take what you can. Yeah, and I I always was taught never sign a PG. Never sign a PG. You don't want to. Um, have I? Yes. Do I regret it? <laughs> Not as if today. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, not that I expect that I will, but you know. It's not ever a preferable thing. Uh, business and entrepreneurship is about risk be reward. So I don't know. Every entrepreneur gets to make that decision. But I think, you know, counsel is wise to advise their client not to sign a personal guarantee whenever possible by definition. But, mm -hmm. but then you get to decide what are the, you know, what are the pros and cons? So anyways, we can talk all day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this section here, Joe talks about reps, warranties, and indemnification clauses in purchase agreements. We had a little miscommunication here, but he talks about how to basically protect yourself in a purchase agreement as a buyer. So pay attention to this. And then after this section, we're then going to talk about uh, equity raising and how to structure equity investments. So let's dive into it. Let's talk about the agreement generally and standard terms of the agreement that you should kind of keep an eye on. Well, I suppose, I mean, just, I mean, they're, oh, I guess I'm pulling a, pulling a classic uh, lawyer thing where I was going to say they're pretty basic, but you know, if you're the one drafting them, I suppose they are. Um, so, you know, the reps and warranties and the indemnity provision are the, the, the real big ones to be looking at. 
and uh, tertiarily, the conditions to closing um, are extremely important. To touch very quickly on that third point, the conditions uh, precedent or the conditions to closing, uh, you really want, this is like, this is the go-to thought. You want to think, what is everything I want in place before I have to pay the seller? Hmm. Everything I need to have, I want all of my boxes checked. And every single one of those things should be listed in your CPs, your conditions precedent. If you leave it out, and, and bigger deals, this can be a, this is very serious. It can be very serious if you leave one thing out, uh, crap can hit the fan. Um, and uh, with smaller deals, you know, uh, you know, people, the sellers are very usually amenable, and they'll make sure stuff gets done. In a bigger deal, they're, they're, they'll force you to pay. <laughs> If you didn't get that one thing you forgot to put in there, they'll force you to pay anyways. That's what, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, so you really got to make sure everything is written explicitly in the CPs that you want done. If it's transfer of title, um, et cetera. Um, so just don't miss anything there. I know a lot of people do skimp over that on smaller deals, and the sellers are nice a lot, and people aren't too concerned you know that's a lazy mentality uh that's 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 a, a that's a way to set yourself up for loss yep. um for uh for uh for um yeah it's a dangerous mentality so to kind of touch on some of the other points from the reps and warranties and this is something that people kind of this is i'm gonna i'm gonna say something here and um at risk of getting too deep into the legal I'm going to say something here that I think will be very helpful for people. Um, uh, people kind of look at reps and warranties and they think, gosh, there's a lot of jargon going on over here. Um, and I think this is the mindset you should go into when you're thinking about your reps and warranties. You should be thinking yourself this. Okay, under contract law, um, the seller told me something. He said, oh, this is the business has this in it. He told it to me verbally, maybe not in writing. He told that to me. I can rely on what he said. Mm. But what he said is not written in the reps and warranties. Well, what is a representation? A representation is a statement. A statement is something that is said. So uh, the reps and warranties are, is everything. Uh, usually there's a clause that says if it's not written here, it's not part of the agreement. So if he said it, but it's not written there, it's not part of the agreement. You cannot go back and sue him even though he said it. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that, that's a big problem there. Uh, so the, the, what happens when people say things wrong, there's a breach of contract and there's a claim for misrepresentation. Um, the cause of that, and I'm not a litigator, by the way. Um, so there's a fly bottom. I'm not a litigator, by the way. Um, but so you have to be thinking, well, if what he said is, uh, what he said is wrong or is what ri is written here wrong, how do I get my money back or how do I protect my downside? And that's by bringing a suit under the terms of the reps and warranties. Um, so you're going to bring a claim for breach of warranty, a claim from, it, by the way, obviously every state uses slightly different words and the law is slightly different here in the states. You know, same for that everywhere else. Um, and so you're going to bring a claim for breach of warranty or a claim for misrepresentation or a claim for breach of contract. And, uh, the causes of action, as they're called, they're a little bit different everywhere. So that's kind of the mindset is, okay, well, what am I relying on here? And what is this, what is this transaction? What do I think it is? What was I told is here? The LOI might have said something, but the LOI is, again, not in your SPA, your subscription agreement or your share purchase agreement. Um, the LOI is not in there. So it might say something. He might have said something. That is, we call it in law. That is not within the four corners of the agreement. Um, and you have to be really careful relying on those things reliance um that's kind of the mindset okay what is what do i want to make sure the seller what what is this transaction make sure it's listed in the reps and warranties and so you'll kind of to give you a really basic example um if there's some real property assets like a warehouse or a factory or something um, there's going to be a thing in there that says there's no environmental problems. All the environmental laws are satisfied. This is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, it, so if you come to learn later that there's huge environmental issues, oh, my gosh, you can be forced to shut down your whole operation for very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, for many months, 
just for that one little issue alone. Um, so if you're buying property, you know, like, okay, there's a rep. He said everything was good. He said there's no problems with the property. I'm just going to rely on them. That's a bad mindset. Instead, you should be thinking, he said that, but let's make sure it's in writing. Let's make sure this clause here says that there's, it says all that stuff. There's nothing wrong with the property. And if that happens, you get to sue them, you get your money or whatever the remedy that, that is set out, you know, you get a remedy. Um, so that's like, that's like the, I having worked on a lot of these infrastructure projects, like, you know, buying and selling oil and gas fields or LNG refinery financings, et cetera. Um, something that is uh, really close to heart is these environmental issues, yeah. the satisfaction of the environmental laws. Uh, it's very common for people to, uh, well, well, if it's an older piece of property, not if it's a new one. If it's a, if it's an older piece of property, it's very common for there to be some issues. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is like licenses. They need a rep and warrant that they have all the licenses to do the business they're doing. What if they were just cutting corner for, corners for 20 years and they were just never caught? Uh, you know, which with smaller business isn't actually an absurd thing to, conje uh, to conjecture, to sort of think uh, as having taken place. Um, you know, like, oh, just no, there was such a small business. Nobody came around and checked. And so, you know, the, the licenses, they didn't have them in place. You're doing the business. Now you realize you can't actually do your business. So getting the license is actually really difficult or depends on the industry, obviously. Uh, and so if it's just some simple, very really simple stuff, that's not necessarily an issue, but you know, license is a very big deal. Uh, so, uh, another one, yeah. yeah. So that, that's some, uh, some points. Now I'll toss it back to you. So I love, okay. Two things. One, that was gold because I think touching on even just broadly defining the reps and the warranties and some of these indemnification clauses, I know on our team, we talk about it all the time. Half of it goes over my head, to be frank, but I <laughs> my best to understand how we're mitigating risk. And that section is about, to my understanding, mitigating risk in a transaction. Um, yeah. You gave some gold there, I think. And at least if nothing else, when folks are talking to their counsel or their lawyer, you at least know to, hey, are we thinking about reps, warranties, and indemnification? Are we thinking about how to mitigate the risk of the transaction? Worthwhile stuff for us deal makers to at least be wary of it for a second i was yeah. for a second i was kind of scratching my head because maybe i misspoke but i thought i was asking you about subscription agreements and, and raising equity and then you talked about reps warranty oh you're oh you were talking about in raising equity i was talking about uh, in relation to buying the yes. vehicle or buying I, the entity oh so what i'll do is i'll clip it <laughs> i'll put in something to say like this is about negotiating the reps warranties in in uh because I think the, the way we went back and forth, there was a, a tad crossing the wires, but it was gold and, and it should be here. So I, I, and I appreciate that. Um, I don't want to take all day of your time. This is, this is taking, I mean, these topics are, that's why I was laughing when we started going, looking at this menu of topics, it's like, shoot, this is not like, this is not light work. We're talking about a lot here. That was gold. It gave a great kind of overview. Maybe the last topic before we wrap, because I don't want to take up your whole night. It's a Friday. But maybe the last yeah, I, I, and, I, and I'm stacked for the rest of the day, too. So I appreciate your consideration. <laughs> yeah. Corporate lawyers tend not to just uh, have these real mild days. Let's do one last quick broad stroke. Could you give a five minute, maybe talk about 506B versus 506C and listing like the risk factors for investors when raising equity? I don't know. I, I kind of love to ask. Can you just touch on it real quick before we uh, we let you go? Yeah. On? So. Sure. So just to be clear here, we're talking about uh, private placements and we're talking about uh, securities, uh, Reg D. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, the, the here's a few basics about this is the uh, in, so in relation to raising capital is the investor uh, an accredited investor? Yeah. Um, this is something that uh, there's like a formula for it. The SEC just recently within the last few years broadened it to make it so that like you can really take advantage of it before it was a little more strict. Um, and so you want to know, is the investor an accredited investor? And you can go online and it's uh, SEC is very good about these things. Uh, they post on the website like the ABCs of how it's defined. What does that mean for you? You literally ask the investor to answer each of those questions. Now, your lawyer would do this. Um, but you literally just ask the investor and you say, okay, um, can you please answer these questions? 
And it's a very clear yes or no situation. It's not too ambiguous. That's the way to approach that. Okay. Now, a second point uh, in relation to this, to understand that a lot of people miss this one, is that when you have to go file your Form D or your lawyer files it, you have to file it in every, you have to file it with the SEC on the Edgar filing system. And you all, the the Edgar, like the, the person's name, Edgar, okay. E-D-G-A-R. Uh, and you also have to file it in every state in which there is an investor um, that you've, you've, you've raised funds from an investor in. So if you have an investor in Texas, an investor in New York, usually New York or California or something like that. Um, and then uh, you, ha you have to file it there too, not just federally. And why? Why do you have to do that? Well, when you do that, you're exempting yourself from the state security laws because there's both – We've just we've talked we're talking about regulation D here. That's federal. And there's also every state has their own securities law mm -hmm. and you have to satisfy both. Mm -hmm. But when you file a form D, there's an there's an exemption, which is that you can also file it with the state and then you don't have to satisfy the state securities law. You get two birds with one stone situation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something people should keep in mind. Uh, you don't want to be, I mean, I know in a lot of these smaller transactions, you know, you're not necessarily going to get in trouble, but that's not the mindset to have. You should kind of just check your boxes or have your lawyer do it. Um, and I guess a, a final note there that I'd add in relation to that is there is a, a well, I mean, you know, okay, here, okay, here, here's, there's two notes. Uh, one thing to be aware of is, you know, are you publicly soliciting for investment? Right. Shouldn't be doing that. Um, you know, like online posting, like, hey, guys, I'm just raising something. You know, this the Internet has changes this area quite a lot. Yeah. Um, are you publicly soliciting investment? Call your buddies up who's an investor. Don't necessarily uh, post all over the Internet. Uh, don't necessarily post something on your website. If you have a website, you know, be be uh, be considerate of that issue in itself. Like publicly, what does that mean? That means oh, well, there's there's a strict definition for it. Uh, but to kind of just speak in very layman's terms here, it's you're like you're talking not just to people in private. That's the opposite of it. So like if you're on Shark Tank or something or not, I can give a, another example. If you have an advertisement on the internet. Like you're paying for an ad and you're saying, hey, come invest in this vehicle or whatever. Um, talking about like a special purpose vehicle when I say vehicle, not a car. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, come invest in this. You're running an ad. I know that most of the audience is probably not doing that, but people do do that. And it's something to keep in mind. That's definitely public. And so you're not going to be getting one of these uh, exemptions. And each, each of these exemptions is different. Um, and the last thing I'll note is that if they're not an accredited investor, um, you can still get a different exemption. It's like the Section 4A. Uh, I'm not going to pull up my stuff, but I think it's the, the Section 4A or something. There's actually many exemptions. Um, these are just some of the common ones for private placement. There's actually many different exemptions. If you're doing an exchange, uh, exchange offer, you're giving them shares and they're giving you shares. There's a whole different exemption. There's, uh, there's several. There's more than 10. Um, and uh, the general rule, just to kind of cover why are we talking about securities law and exemptions? Well, if you don't satisfy an exemption, then you have to register your securities. Registering securities is a lot of work. You, it's the second option. It's not your go-to plan. Uh, people, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing because it's not a moral issue. It's just like it's just like A or B, and A is way easier and way less expensive. Um, and A is satisfying an exemption. And uh, and there's several of them, so you should kind of check what they are. And, and the most common ones are the ones we're talking about here under what's called Reg B. And the form that you have to file, there's a different form you have to file based off your situation, uh, is Form D. So th is that what you wanted me to touch on? Because I feel like it was oh, there's a lot of stuff. Because like I said earlier, securities law is opening uh, a big area, a big can of worms. No, I I think you hit the I mean, look, to put it, it to, to try to paraphrase, there's a lot of considerations here. You can't just go out and raise equity from someone and like have them wire you a hundred grand and then you're off. Like there's, there's more to it than that. And that's where having someone like Joe is meaningful on your team. 
or, or to have that counsel. I know in the, the reason I brought up, I think what is referenced, or at least I reference is 506 C is like the more broad solicitation. Like there's a lot of, you can't just go on a microphone and broadcast your, your investment without, you know, there, there's ways to be a little bit more outspoken about it is my understanding, but you have to be real particular about they be accredited that you file correctly, that you can't just, you know, and maybe I don't want to, I know you got to go soon, but I don't want to put you on a path where you can't comment, but there, there's a lot to it is my understanding. I'm not a lawyer. That's why we have Joe, but you know, there's a lot to it. Yeah. The 2013 jobs act has on a uh, different changes and there, there's, there's just different ways you can go about raising equity funds. And uh, that's kind of the way to think about it. It's like, well, what do I want to do? And then what are the what are the different exemptions? Because each exemption is very different. Hmm. Uh, you're allowed to do different things, whether it's public solicitation, um, whether it's with an accredited investor or a non-accredited investor. So those are kind of the key things you kind of have to keep in mind um, when you're looking at when, when you're thinking of raising equity. Um, and and again, securities is such a it, it is a big can of worms. And that's why I'm uh, I'm going to leave it at that, because, you know, it, it's if you look at the Securities Act, you know, sit down for about six months if you want to understand every piece of it. That, that's how complicated these things get. Yeah. We'll see you at the next Olympics. Um, no, that's 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 useful. Look, I want to let you go help you go uh, put some billable hours on the board, if you will. Where can we first of all, thank you. Uh, Personally, and I know the audience will agree. I mean, you just came here and shared a ton of insight. Um, I, I really want to say thank you. Where should the people go? Those who are qualified that are looking, who are you serving? Where should, where should, uh, who's your ideal customer or client? And uh, where should they go to, to learn more about you or to, to work with you or to get more in, in contact with you? Thanks. And hey, it was a pleasure talking to you. It was real nice. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it's, it's fun to be able to have the chance to talk about something that you, when you're behind a desk indoors all day, hmm. <laughs> to be able to do something that's a little more uh, like this is definitely really fun. So I appreciate you having me on. Um, where can people reach out to me? Well, my uh, email address is joe at principe.com. That's P-R-E-N-C-I-P-E uh, dot com. And so you can email me directly. Uh, and uh, who do I represent? Well, if you're if you're buying a business, uh, even if it's a small business, like two million bucks, um, we do represent those the the micro caps, the small businesses too. Um, our typical transaction is ten to twenty million, um, uh, and we specifically represent and are focused on acquisition entrepreneurs, whether it's your first time or your nth time. Um, we we take an approach where we're we're guiding people and educating them along the process and making them aware of the issues as we go along, sort of this very uh, mentor style mentality. Um, and so you can email me directly. Um, also, I mean, we have a website, you could check it out. Um, optimist legal, like optimist as opposed to pessimist, not optimist prime. <laughs> That's not what it is. Uh, and optimistlegal.com, uh, no punctuation marks or anything. And uh, yeah, that's our website, you know. But you can reach out to me at my email is fine. And uh, that's about it, frankly. I think uh, I think this time was well spent. I think we we definitely hit off on a, a broad range of topics. And uh, there's there's a lot to it. But I feel like we were able to kind of keep people alarmed or uh, ring the bell a little bit on, hey, here's some things to don't just kind of don't just think it's paperwork and not want to do it. Yeah. So. I love that. I agree. And uh, again, appreciate it. I've had a good time. It's been fun. I learned some things here, took some notes. I think everyone here, if you've been paying attention, there's a lot to learn. We'll get this thing uh, uploaded and I will <laughs> contact you when it, goes, when it goes live. But for the sake of letting you get back to it, um, hey, thanks for everything. And I, I appreciate it. No, I thank you too, Jason. All right, I'll, let's keep in touch. We'll talk to you later. All right, partner. Take care now. Bye-bye. Later. Hey, it's Jason Rogers. Thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to subscribe, thumbs up the video, and for more, go to jasonpaulrogers.com.